Welcome back to another episode of Gardening with Ryan. We've got some rants prepared for today, but first we're going to check on the state of things. Let's check the pots. Lots of green there. Remember how these were more yellowish last time we looked? They look more green now. This looks good, and we have these not clovers, whatever they are, growing. Um, even though, remember we were concerned about this one dying and drying out? These look like new leaves to me. So, I think it's all right. And then, here's just our jar where we, our pot where we just throw everything in there. That one's not too important. But notice we've got some more sprouts of whatever this is. That's neat. And I'm happy to report, look at all this grass spread. It's exactly what I wanted to accomplish, but even just pop-ups like here, 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 there. Remember, I was like, this area, look, it, it, it's turning green. I was like, this area is just gross. And see, and I can already tell that the soil started to get a little bit dry. Well, that one's still wet from when we watered it. But we had a couple hot days. You'll see right here, right there, that like there's mountains. It's still pretty wet, to be honest. But with all the look at, see that's not like perfectly wet. It's you can tell that the top layer is dry, and those are have lots of pretty flowers on them right now. We got this. And. We've got a pot that is being used for apparently nothing. Oh, that's interesting. What's in there? Dirt. Like really fresh dirt. Oh, there's stuff living in there. Is that a worm? What is that? You, you see the movement, guys, right? Like, what's going on in there? Ooh, this looks awesome. This is probably some really good, like, fertile dirt if worms are just, like, chilling in there. This might be, like, a little unintentional compost bin. Like the one we gave up on before. The question is, what do we want to plant in it? <laughs> That's kind of cool. I'm actually going to leave some of the leafy... But, that's pretty cool. I didn't really realize that we had that. Um, is there anything out here that's like, cuttable that we don't have in this back area yet? Because I know the backyard has plenty of succulents. Ooh, what about this? I think it's called ice plant. Um, is that transplantable? We're gonna find out. Come on. Okay, I don't wanna like Brutalize the plant, taking a cutting here. But to be honest, the more I kind of split it down the middle, the better, because 
That's more like spot for roots to form. I oh. Oh, that was not meant to flip her. What's up, everybody? They say to cut, like, plants at a 45-degree angle because if you do it flat, they'll just, like, heal over and not root or something. That's not a 45-degree angle, but you know what I call that? Close enough. So... I think the best way to go about this would be this is this a stick yes it sure is see we have a stick and I think the most efficient way to go about this would be to poke a hole in the center with said stick by the way yeah I know nothing about gardening really practi I know practically nothing however I made the first episode of this. People liked it. People keep liking it. So, I'm gonna keep making it. And I like how that's gonna wanna get more sun and like grow up, I feel like. But what I really wanna focus on right now, okay, this is my stick, it will go here. What I really want to focus on now is, like, getting all this grass growth going. So, all of this that dried out, we're going to just, like, spray it down to get some grass going. You can see how that dried out back there. Like, even right after watering, it doesn't take long. And if we're going to... Oh, look! Look at all that. Look at that green in there. If we're going to make this area green, i got to be a bit more consistent. Yeah, see that? Awesome. A bit more consistent about, I don't know, mainly just keeping it wet. Where should this go? It's really good over here, I think. Especially because it's not too much to show off yet. I'll put it right on top of the Mm, I wanted to block this. Ah, that, that's not that important right now. It's just an extension of that. I'm somewhere between let that grow out and kill it, but I'm just not going to do anything to it. And I'm just going to let it do its thing. Um... I actually feel like ice plant has a really good potential of looking really nice. There's a big empty boring area right here. So it's just right there. And sun's going down getting kind of late but they say that's a good time to water and I love that dog it's barked I, I, I've, I've, I've it's greeted me with barks for years and years There goes the aqua. Up, oh, yep. Like usual, kink in the hose, but nice. Fix itself. You know, you gotta pick and choose your battles and dealing with kinks in the hose, I've decided, is most of the time not worth it. So, let's just get the, uh, we don't need a whole lot of water today. We just kind of need to make everything a bit wet. To keep encouraging this grass type growth. Let me see if I can get more of a, there we go. That's more of like a sprinkler type effect. 
just kind of fan over everything. Those ultra dry homies. This has been really relaxing, and I've enjoyed just spending time outside with plants. I know I have no idea what I'm doing, but it's a lot of fun. And if people like watching it, even cooler. But Time in the sun, it feels good, it's good for you. If you're considering taking up gardening, I would just do it. It's as easy as getting one house plant, like one pot and seed and just planting something on a windowsill. I think, I don't know, I'm just getting started. And then I'm not sure if we are watering this one so much that we're like drowning it out or not watering it enough. But I'd rather over than underwater. Yes, I know California's in a drought right now, but Look at that, our spray. Like, it's in a drought, but... Would you stop watering your garden? If you would, I mean, all power to you, but... Anyway, while I'm here just doing this, I'm going to go on a bit of a side rant. Many of you probably know from looking at my channel that I am a Christian. And I'm not here to go on... Okay, basically I want to preface this by saying please don't take any of my theological opinions too seriously. I am in no way, shape, form, or measure qualified to teach on any theological matter. These are just my ponderings. However, here's what's been on my mind, theologically. One thing, a lot has been, but um, one thing in particular. I don't know where I denominationally belong right now. And... I think that's large, it, it, it's due to doctrinal things, but also due to just some drama situations with the church. That's not important. My point is that's all not relevant to this rant. So, or not rant, but just curiosity. So, I spent quite a while as a Roman Catholic well, I was baptized Roman Catholic, so I started going to confession and communing and, um, you know, like, spent most of my life as an atheist taking it seriously. And eventually ended up a reformed Protestant. That's the story of that's not important. What's important is the point of what brought me out of Roman Catholicism and into Protestantism was what I perceive to be an impossible necessary standard for staying in this state of grace. Not really the standard Protestant apologetics, because I, I went straight from, like, Roman Catholicism to, like, hyper high church Anglo-Catholicism. Like, prayed to Mary, but sola fide kind of deal, which was kind of based and that's still on the table right now. I don't know. But, um... I left because 
of the mortal venial sin distinction primarily because I wasn't too concerned that they were saying you're not redeemed by the merits of Christ or anything like that. You have to like earn it like that. That was not really the point for me. I think there. I think that's a. I think soteriology is a very important discussion. I think justification and the nature of it is a very important discussion. However, the difference between like ontological and forensic salvation is kind of for dweebs a lot of the time rather than the average person. I feel like either way. I started to struggle with the mortal venial sin distinction because a mortal sin, and Roman Catholics, I am so sorry if I misrepresent you here, I haven't been a Roman Catholic in a long time, and if any Roman Catholics say, no, this is what's true, go with what they say because I'm not one, nor am I qualified to speak for them, but if I remember correctly, it has to be a grave matter, like a serious matter, you have to know it's very serious, and you have to do it willfully for something to be a mortal sin. Except there was no dogmatic checklist of mortal sins. People would often point to the passages about those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I heard from a lot of Protestants the law-gospel distinction, and that was law, and that's what kind of moved me that in the Protestant way. But anyway... I was like, okay, well, Jesus says, if I look at a woman with lust, I've committed adultery in my heart. And I go to the Roman Catholic sources, and I see, is our sexual thoughts mortal sin? Depends. Is this a mortal sin? Depends. And I remember in catechesis, and I'm not trying to roast Roman Catholicism here, I'm actually going to get to a different point. I got to catechesis, and there was a big checklist of possible mortal sins. Like, that's a pretty normal thing of things that are mortal sins for confession. Well, adult catechesis for a baptized person is a little bit different. But, um, anyway. In the Protestant world, there is a lot of discussion about homosexuality in the church, um, female pastors, a lot of ethical issues right now are are being discussed. Ethics in general is a hot topic in the church. And I'm just going to ask a series of questions to all of my viewers, and I think my questions will help you see where my curiosity lies. So, in the Protestant world, people often speak about evidences that somebody is not a true believer. From all stripes. The uh, conservative Protestant groups of pretty much all stripes would talk about, okay, if somebody's in a homosexual marriage, I'm probably not going to commune them or make them a pastor or Okay, pastor and communion and them are totally different discussions, so forget I said that. I'm probably not going to commune them or admit them to membership. Or, like, the transgenderism or women in office. Those are often called apostate denominations and such. And that's the line of thought that I have historically been inclined to. This sort of conservative, well, of course... People who do these things aren't Christians. They obviously don't care. But then... I started to, I don't know, dig. And... I was faced with the issue of... Just in trying to work through these things. Where's my systematic? If I'm going to draw a line between how much sin where you really mean it because okay there there are times often throughout my entire christian journey where i have sinned and known it was a sin and where is the systematic line where a person has sinned grievously enough or willfully enough that they have not evidenced true conversion 
And if that line does exist, if there is some line where a person is obviously not a Christian because they do X this often, I would think it would be of utmost necessity to systematize that theology. Because you're drawing lines between salvation and damnation. There needs to be a very clear systematic line drawn there. But I don't really see that. I, I see from different Protestant traditions a different articulations of that. And I'm not saying... And there are Protestants that don't have the whole thing, of course, but... um. I have a friend whose opinion is, and I'm not sure that I've been convinced of this opinion, but I I will say that it's it's hard to find the flaw in it. The church does not confess an ethic as an article of faith. It confesses Christ crucified. And as soon as you start drawing those mortal venial sin lines, if there's not a rule of faith for it, you end up right back in the same place of just like bouncing in and out of the state of grace every time you sin and mean it and he would say that the whole point of the reformation is that's the situation we've all found ourselves stuck in so this friend said I would absolutely commune a homosexual but I absolutely affirm that it is wrong So, I touched a little on ontological versus forensic salvation. Here's what I mean by that. There was a big debate in the Reformed world about if salvation or justification is by faith alone. Look up R. Scott Clark, John Piper, salvation, faith alone on Google. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll get caught up to speed. We're going to water the heck out of this ice plant to give it some big potential. Ooh, it's all just draining out the bottom. That's some wet dirt. Honestly, just gonna hit this a little more, but, um, anyway. John Piper, Mark Jones, and his camp maintained that it's not right to say that salvation is by faith alone, but rather that the language of saying that justification or being made right with God or as other people would categorize it, the state of grace is by faith alone. Yet salvation is through works. Mark Jones came out in defense of Piper. R. Scott Clark condemned Piper as a heretic and that being a false gospel. Now, if within the Reformed world, people couldn't even agree on if people were heretics or preaching a false gospel, even people in fellowship with each other, that was a little disheartening. But the question came up. If the Mark Jones and John Piper people were right, and I'm not here to talk about who's right and who's not, I'm just here to bounce off ideas. If they were right, that salvation does indeed, is indeed by faith and works, isn't it really a kind of a geeky category and something that would probably be lost on most lay people to talk about, um, well, forensically you are made right with God by grace through faith, but becoming ontologically made into a perfect creation in the new Eden begins now, and you're cooperating with that. Like, that's just geek vocabulary. But if works equal heaven, oh, but it's not judicially, it's this, it's this. Like, who cares? That's geek categories. So I think we're kind of presented with two options. We either, we can hold salvation 
by faith, I'm not saying throw it out. I'm saying there are two op- there, I, I, to me it seems and my opinion should not be taken seriously on theological things. I'm just rambling because this is just what's on my mind and when I do this show I talk about what's on my mind. I think the two possible ways you can go is saying Yes, justification is indeed by faith alone. Salvation is by faith and works. Rome has erred. But I don't think you can go all the way and say that Rome is just full-out apostate. If you hold the other claim that salvation is indeed by works. I don't think you can... I don't think you can say the gospel was saved because we figured out that the the forensic part of salvation or the legal part was by faith, but the uh, substance part was by works. And now that we have these geeky categories all lined up and our ordo salutis is perfect, we have everything saved. I don't think that's a consistent narrative. I think it's fine to say the Roman church was in severe error and this was corrected. But to say that, oh, they were just like total apostates, false church because of work salvation, that seems inconsistent. And I think the other option, that ca- the other path that can be taken, it seems, and feel free to leave any thoughts anyone might have, you might have. But the other only consistent thought, if you are going to go full on, Rome is apostate. None of salvation involves works, that's anathema, all that. The consistent thing would be, it seems, well, to just say that. But, and and stop there. You know? Like, I think there's a consistency in that. However, I think there's an inconsistency there, even for people who hold that position, because... Okay. Reform people who are on the Clark side of this. Go survey your favorite theologians and see how many said that sanctification which is part of salvation is by works. I'm not saying they're wrong in this video. There may be videos in the future where I talk about who I think is right and wrong, but that'll probably be when I feel much more secure in my theology. This is just me ranting about inconsistencies and problems I see from a lay level of practical issues. Of where's, because I've always struggled with scrupulosity uh, and you know, have if you are going to say there is a line where if you sin this much you're not a Christian I, 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 I'm just inclined to think that that needs to be really explicitly drawn where that is like really explicitly because I mean if it's the line between life and death and the other side would say well do you believe But, now, of course, both sides would have, can claim this, but one would say you don't believe if you do these things. Um, That's a fact. You need to check your faith. That's how they would interpret examining yourself. Now, some of you watching that know my opinions might be like, angry right now because I'm being too nice to certain positions or in your thoughts. But don't worry, I'm still just as edgy as always. Like, this this video just isn't really for the purpose of me going on a rant about what I think. It's actually just me watering the yard. But I really wanted to get this dirt nice and really wet to promote all that beautiful new grass growth. (laughs) 
Anyway, bummed I didn't make it to church today, but, like, it's my fault. So, I haven't been in so long. By my own fault, but... That's also not the topic of this video. And that's also one of the reasons why you should not listen to me as a theologian. If you want to know what the Bible teaches, ask your pastor, not me, man. Like, this is... This is this, this is for theology dweebs to talk about. This is. I just don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that I'm like, coming on here to be like, all right, everybody, I'm here to teach you about the Christian faith and what's true and what's not, and fight denominational wars. Even if I was, I'm not ready or qualified. yet so for the time being I'm going to keep doing WDDB what do your denominations believe interviewing people check those out on this channel if you haven't I interviewed a Lutheran cleric and an Anglican seminarian to get a view of those traditions, and I'm trying to get a view of essentially every tradition, every major tradition. And well, I think it'll benefit a lot of people because I want to know what traditions believe and even after joining tradition, sometimes I don't know. There, there, there are, like, things that they consider key details that I didn't hear about until years later. So, I think the best format to find out what traditions believe is get people that are educated on that tradition and then ask them, what do you think people should hear about your tradition? Because, I mean... Let's see what they claim about themselves instead of just, like, hearing apologetics against people if they want to hear what people believe. That reminded me of a fantastic podcast episode I listened to of um, my friend uh, Connor Longafee's uh, podcast where he is covering Anabaptist theology right now proper, like Anabaptists, like the Amish, the Mennonites, uh, what they believe, like what their faith statement would look like. They're using Menno Simmons' work as a textbook, and they've got an interesting panel on there. They've got someone who belongs to a church that has Anabaptist roots. Um, there's a pastor on there as well, another Lutheran pastor, I believe, to give another unique perspective on everything... Uh, Connor sang, and Connor just, I mean, Anabaptist theology is almost never talked about, and I knew a little bit of it. Radical Reformation, they were kind of crazy, because they liked to burn stuff down, but also be pacifists or something, I think. Like, okay, S sorry, Anabaptists, I, I, I'll, at the burn stuff down thing. That's just literally all I heard, like Anabaptists taking control of cities and stuff, that kind of thing. But I, I don't, you can attack any tradition that way. I'm just saying that's all I ever heard about. And I knew that they were the people that Baptists were very careful to say we're not them. And that Amish baptized by sprinkling, but they're Credo Baptists. That's pretty much where it ended, and I had no idea what their soteriology was, or like the questions we'd want to know. And I learned that they have a doctrine of the celestial flesh. <laughs> Meaning that... Connor explained it better than I did, but I guess in uh, their theology... Uh, the celestial flesh doctrine is the doctrine that Christ did not assume his humanity from the Virgin Mary, but rather 
took it with him from heaven. Heading inside the house now. Eh. I'll close this one out. Oh, a light. Perfect. Thanks for watching this episode of Gardening with Ryan. I'll see you guys on whatever the heck I make next.